We're dipping into the Q&A archives as the COVID epidemic continues. In this episode, you'll hear from journalist Susanna Kahalen, who extensively researched a 1973 study by Stanford psychologist David Rosenhan, which fundamentally changed the way psychological disorders are treated in America. Her book, The Great Pretender, The Undercover Mission That Changed Our Understanding of Madness. A group of colleagues and I gained admission to psychiatric hospitals by simulating, by faking, a single symptom which was that we said that we heard voices, and the voices said, empty, dull, thud. The moment we were admitted to the hospital, we abandoned our symptom, and we behaved the way we usually behave. The question was, would anyone detect that we were sane? The answer was, no. Susanna Cahalan, your new book, The Great Pretender, really centers around the story of this man. Who is he? This is a man, he's a Stanford professor named David Rosenhan, and he was the architect of this amazing study that that you have this incredible footage that you just played called On Being Sane in Insane Places. And just as he described, he and seven other people purportedly went undercover in psychiatric hospitals around the country. And their whole mission was to kind of test the nature of, of diagnosis and to see if their sanity would be detected. And as he said, they were not. Yeah. This study was done in the early 1970s, uh, 69 published in the early 1970s. Why are you interested in it today in 2019? You know, it came from a very personal place. So I, uh, you know, merged from my book, uh, my, my previous book, my memoir, Brain on Fire, um, which chronicled my experience with an autoimmune disease that targeted my brain that was briefly misdiagnosed as a serious mental illness, in, in my case, originally a bipolar disorder and then schizoaffective disorder. And after that book came out, I was inundated by emails from the general public who, a lot of people who were looking for answers like my own, some of whom who actually found answers because of my book. But I also was, received many emails from people who felt lost within the mental health system, who felt that um, they were not being seen and they were not being heard. And, you know, really, really kind of atrocious stories of their care. And I started to question a lot of these issues of diagnosis and misdiagnosis. And the question is, what, of what is mental illness? And this led me um, specifically to um, one story that I, I kind of call the, my mirror image. And that really had an effect on me. We uh, have a cl- trailer from Netflix we're going to play a little bit of because your book was then made into a movie. Yes. And I want to show it to people who didn't read your first book uh, to get a little sense of what you went through. Oh, let's watch. I felt really sick, you know, my head hurts, my stomach hurts, and my, my hands numb. And I've never felt this before. We've tested Susanna for every infectious disease. All of the results are negative. We're going to get to the bottom of this together. Her EEG is completely normal. Her MRI is normal. Her neurological exam is normal. It's all normal. Her condition continues to regress. Manic behavior, paranoia. Each of them is giving us a different diagnosis. One is saying bipolar. Next one is saying schizophrenic. Then they're saying psychotic. We should look at hospitals that are better equipped to deal with her. Just take the pills. She needs all of us. We will find the answer. When did this happen to you? So this was 2009. I was 24 at the time. And um, just as you can see, I mean, it was uh, a lot of that time I don't remember, actually. And it's always very bizarre to see it recreated in movie form because it's I wrote a book about a time that is very much lost to me. And then it was recreated in a movie. So I have very, very strange feelings about that whole experience. But, you know, in short, as it, as it was depicted, you know, I experienced very serious signs of, of, of serious mental illness, typically associated with serious mental illness, which was psychosis and hallucinations, delusions. I was violent. Um, I was paranoid. I was, I was angry. Uh, and, you know, at, there are various points doctors had various diagnoses that ran the gamut from bipolar disorder to schizoaffective disorder to kind of, you know, various other theories in between. How did you get better? So I got um, very lucky, and that's something that I very much understand now to a greater degree having done The Great Pretender, this new book. Um, but I, I came across, I chanced upon this amazing, forward-thinking Beautifully, beautiful soul of a doctor who really listened to me and listened to my parents and really took a very in-depth patient history 
and was able to dig in and discover the cause, which was at, at that time a very newly discovered autoimmune disease of the brain called anti-NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis, which is a mouthful, but yes. And so uh, what was the treatment plan? Were you, uh, it was medication, pharmaceuticals that made you better ultimately? No, it was not. It was actually um, the kind of the arsenal that you would use to treat any other autoimmune disease. In my case, that was steroids, um, plasma exchange, blood exchange, you know, plasma out of your blood and exchanged with new plasma and IVIG treatment. Um, and and that, was, that was what cured me. So uh, is there a chance you will get it again or are you cured for life? Do you know? Unfortunately, since it was only, this disease itself was only named in 2007. I was treated in 2009. I was a 217th person. So the natural history of the illness is not, you know, it's not well understood. So there are a lot of question marks. And one of those is, is the relapse rates. There are relapse rates. It can come back. But luckily, what I have on my side is I was treated very swiftly and aggressively. Another example of my kind of luck. Um, so hopefully those rates are lower, but uh, I, do, I do live with the threat that it could return. So you were out on the book tour and you kept hearing from people saying, maybe my diagnosis yes. is also wrong. Exactly. So how did you get from there to this project? Well, actually out on book tour, um, as you said, in Boston, I, that around that time I had actually encountered the story that would haunt me of this young woman uh, when I was doing kind of proselytizing. I was talking about this illness who, to whomever who would listen to me. And I, I really wanted to get the word out that this condition existed. And at one point, I found myself in a psychiatric hospital presenting to the doctors there. And after my presentation, one of the doctors came up to me and said, we have a woman here. She sounds a lot like you. And we're going to test her for your illness. And I remember walking through the halls of that hospital thinking, is, is that the person? Is that the person? You know, I remember just being kind of very moved by the thought that someone in there could have had what I had. And I found out two weeks later, this person did have what I had. She she fit the same profile that I did and had the same diagnosis, but there was a stark difference between us. I was misdiagnosed for one month, and she was misdiagnosed for two years. And she had been misdiagnosed with schizophrenia. And unfortunately, her doctor told me that she would never fully recover and that she would operate the rest of her life as a, a quote, permanent child. And this really, I mean, not only angered me, but it galvanized me to continue asking these questions of what is mental illness. And at that point, I actually mentioned this story to two neuroscientists who I'm friendly with. And one of them turned to me and said, you know, you, you and this woman are kind of like modern day pseudo patients. And I had no idea what she meant by that. And that night she sent me the study on being sane in insane places, which asks very similar questions to the ones that were percolating around my mind of kind of what is diagnosis, what is mental illness, what do these labels mean, are there, is there validity there? And I remember reading the pages of that, of that study and thinking like, and feeling really seen and really relating to it on a deep level. You write in the book, the ability to accurately answer this question, what is mental illness, shapes everything from how we medicate, treat, insure, and hospitalize, how we police, and whom we choose to imprison. Yeah. This is pretty broad. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about why this topic it covers so many aspects of society? Well, I mean, I think in, in the kind of very, the, the kind of broad general idea of what is eccentricity, what is personality trait, what is pathological. I mean, these questions are about the self, who we are, how we define ourselves. So that touches all of us. But in, in the kind of broader sense, the idea of, of what is mental illness does affect, you know, if someone behaves in a way during the time of, an, of a psychotic experience, should we look at it at, in the same way if someone was not psychotic, you know? So the, the, the labels and the context of these diagnoses has an effect in the way we see the people who, who ha you know, for better or for worse, people who have these illnesses. So... I mean, I think that it has a, it's a broad, wide swath of, of an influence on, on our on culture and society. By profession, you are a journalist. Yes. So how did you use your journalism skills in answering these questions? So I read that study, and I immediately related to it, and I thought, I really want to know more. I want to know more about David Rosenhan, who is so alluring to me in many ways. He's a very charismatic man. And I wanted to know more about these other volunteers. He had seven other people who he had, you know, recruited to go undercover. Who were these people? And why did they kind of put their lives in the line for this, for this assignment? And for what reason? Uh, so I started to dig. And at that point, I got access to his unpublished book, his diary entries, and uh, eight banker's boxes worth of correspondences that, that kind of um, 
just you know, chronicled his, his career at Stanford. And I started to dig, and um, that dig turned into a six-year investigation from there. Six yeah. years, and how, how far did it take you geographically? I, honestly, all over the country, um, also actually into, into uh, England as well. But mostly I, I hopscotched back from, from uh, Haverford area, the Haverford Swarthmore area, and Stanford. And those were kind of my home turfs, but I went everywhere in between, just on this wild goose chase for these seven other people and more information about David Rosenhan himself. Well, we know about Stanford because that's where he taught. What was the Haverford connection? So before he was recruited to Stanford based on this study, when he was working on this study, kind of rumors that he was working on something big reached Stanford and he was recruited there to become a full-time professor there, a tenured professor. And he was previously at, at, at um, Swarthmore. And it was there that the, the idea for the study came to him. And it wasn't actually his own idea, which is what I discovered in his unpublished book. But it was actually his students in an abnormal psychology seminar who, actually, who asked him, you know, we want to see what I, the idea of madness up close. And he actually said to them, okay, if you want to see it up close, become a mental patient. These were his words. You know, go undercover in a psychiatric hospital. And they all said, yes, we want to. And it, what the problem was, when he actually posed this idea to their parents, none of them approved it. So David Rosenhan decided to go in himself. And that's where the kind of germs of this study started. Well, well I want to get back to the study in a bit, but your readers of your book will also get a brief history of how this country and I guess Western societies have treated mental illness over time. So uh, I'd like to have you walk us through a little bit of that. Let's say the early part of the 20th century, people who were diagnosed with mental illness, what were the options available uh, and, uh, as we, you know, the dawn turned on the last century? Well, I mean, I mean, we've had so many different stages in terms of our, the way we treat and view mental illness. You know, I kind of start the book with the story of uh, Nellie Bly. I mean, that's kind of where I start in terms of the modern history of psychiatry. Because you can go back to, you know, sure, you know sure. we, we could go back forever, but, you know, with ancient Egyptians boring holes in people's skulls to try to release the demons of the mind, these questions have plagued us, you know, humanity for forever, you know. And so, but I started with Nellie Bly. Um, who was this amazing woman, a, a, a original, what we call sob sister, um, who was a kind of, uh, who, you know, they wrote the sob stories. They were these kind of amazing investigative r- reporters um, back when women didn't do such things. And she, at, in her early 20s, went undercover uh, in a hospital on uh, Blackwell's Island, and now is Roosevelt Island. And it was notorious. It was a, a hellhole. And she went undercover as a psychiatric patient, kind of one of the first to do so in this kind of really um, over-the-top tabloidy way. And what she found there was appalling. Basically, it, the idea of insanity, or you know, it was a one-size-fits-all. You know, if you were off or different, you could, you would be basically put into a hospital, an, an insane asylum. And their care did not exist. Um, there was neglect, and there was outright abuse. And what she chronicled in the kind of two-part expose has really shocked the country, um, but was going on all over the place in the, in, during the turn of the century. And, and who paid for those institutions, which were all over the country at that time? I, I, th- I believe that we paid for them during that time, too. Yeah. Some were private, as, as they are now. It's a similar thing. There are state institutions and there are private institutions, yeah. So then uh, tech- technology started coming along, and uh, there's something called electroshock therapy. Yes. When d- is that still in use today? It is, and it's and actually... What does that do? It's electroconvulsive therapy now. Uh, it's very different than it was then. It's still very controversial. Um, but, you know, it, it's interesting because in the time that David Rosenham was going undercover, it was still the kind of scary electroconvulsive therapy we kind of think of and we associate with movies like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Um, and, the, you know, these are, these are therapies that were created um, that a lot of people describe as sledgehammers because we don't really know how, how they work. You know, they send electrical cur- currents to the brain. In the past, they would induce seizures and people would break, break their backs and bite their tongues. This, this is no longer the case. It's very different now. But these were, these were kind of, these contributed to the general public's uh, distrust of psychiatric institutions and psychiatry at that time that David Rosenham went undercover. And there's uh, another thing that um, you can tell us when it became put into use, but it is a procedure called a lobotomy. What's a lobotomy? Yes. That is one of the darkest chapters in the history of medicine and in psychiatry in particular. And, you know, it was first um, uh, created 
there was a first tested out on chimpanzees, and it's basically a shutting off of the connection between the prefrontal lobe and the rest of the brain, and it's supposed to reduce higher functioning, basically, and it's supposed to. It was intended to treat psychosis and a host of other. I mean, again, this idea of one size fits all insanity. It, it was choose to treat homosexuality and and psychosis and depression. I mean, it was a. It was just, a, again, one of these disgusting sledgehammers um, that we should be very ashamed, ashamed of in our past. In, in 1991, the BBC did a documentary on mental health called Madness, and they had uh, interviews with the two people that really popularized, maybe even invented this procedure, Dr. James Watt and yes. Dr. Walter Freeman. Yes. I have a little clip to show people. Let's watch that. Wonderful. That is a picture of me. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and there's Walt Freeman. See, there's the Lucatone. Oh, the surgeon the hemostat on the blunt detector. The I had no misgivings about uh, lobotomy until uh, Dr. Freeman began to do the transoptical lobotomies in his office. And one day I walked in, and as he was doing a lobotomy, and uh, he's a great man for recording things photogra- photographically. And so he usually had someone hold the ice pick while he took the photograph. And he, he asked me, he says, Jim, will you hold that ice pick while I take the a photograph? I didn't want to be, uh, have a picture of me holding an ice pick in a patient's hand. So I said, no, I'd rather not. It, it's really hard hard to watch it uh, is this procedure how long was it practiced i mean it was practiced i think it i'm not sure exactly the time it went out but many people in this country i mean i think hundreds of thousands of people in this country underwent it and the kind of the most shocking story for me um or poetic in many ways um was the story of, of rosemary kennedy who had an who had a lobotomy done by walter freeman and james watts uh you know I, I read a lot about other biographers had had featured had had done books about Rosemary and I and the passages about her pre and post lobotomy were heartbreaking. Before she had her mother giving birth um, had had a difficult birth and I think there was oxygen deprived to her brain. She'd always been a little bit different than the rest of her siblings, but she was vivacious and very alive and very strong willed and beautiful. And after the lobotomy, um, I think one of the writers described her as a, a painting that had been brutally slashed. She could hardly come up with any words. She walked forever pigeon-toed. And um, she would basically be an invalid the rest of her life. It was a travesty. So often we see in this town of Washington that uh, political figures who have personal stories in their lives use them to galvanize public policy efforts. So how did the Kennedy family, in particular her brother, who became president of the United States, incorporate this experience into view of and work on mental health issues? You know, this was a, a kind of amazing story, the connection between Rosemary and how it affected us in the long term. JFK obviously was very affected by his sister's story, and that, I think, 100% had an, had an effect on his um, policy, which was the Community Mental Health Care Act, which he kind of turned away from many of the institutions in a, and in a bid to create, um, you know, com- a community care model, which would take people out of these warehouses of where people were mistreated and abused and neglected and have people treated in the community. And that was the ideal of it. Um, unfortunately, uh, he died before the, the, any of this was actually actualized. And the result was that these community care models were not enacted, and the money did not follow the patients, even though the hospitals did close. You write that the second step of that was when Lyndon Johnson came into office with the signing of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. Mm -hmm. What happened in that point that affected federal policy about mental health treatment? There's there's something called the IMD exclusion, which start, which reduced, um, well, eliminated funding for any hospitals that were had bigger, more than I think 16 beds. So that just again facilitated the mass closure of a lot of these big state institutions uh, that were again very broken and needed fixing, but they were outright closed um, without any safety net in place or any place for very sick people to go. So the state versus federal role in treating mental health happened. Uh, changed as a result of that. So what did states, were they were expecting something from the federal government that never materialized? I guess they were trying to kind of push off the, they knew they weren't going to get the funding. So 
you know, what was the, res what was the, what was the outcome? They would close the institutions. If they were going to just be losing money, the result was if they closed the institution, they would save money. It was really a follow-the-money story, I think. Mm -hmm. So some statistics that, uh, you, as you mentioned, the community care aspect of this never materialized. Although, you know, I just found in our archives that they celebrated the 50th anniversary of this act uh, passing as though it had a big impact. Did it, did it have a big impact at all on society? Of course it did. I mean, I think you walk the streets and see people who are, you know, I think it closed a lot of places that were terrible. But I think it left a lot of people who needed our help the most without help. So it had a huge effect on closing very bad places, which is a, that's a great thing, but I think that it, it, it did not full, it was not fully actualized. And I think that the community, I think that there's a lot that could have been done with, this, with these ideals. And, there, and, and in fact, I, I relate to a lot of the idea of treating people within the community. That's a wonderful model, but it just, the money was not there. And you, you, you can see it on your walk. For me in New York City, I can see it on my walk to work every day. With people, with you know, passing homeless people who are very seriously sick. So the stat that you have in your book is 90 percent of the mental health beds that were available when JFK signed the bill in 1963 have closed, yeah. and at the same time our population has doubled yes. in about that time. So then, where are these people going? I mean, you know, of course, there's a it's a broad and very complex story. We have more drugs available to treat people. Perhaps many of some of those people would not need to be hospitalized. That is a valid point. But there are still very sick people um, who, who aren't getting the help they need. So, you know, we are, I think, at last count, um, there's, there's kind of wonderful work done by someone named DJ Jaffe um, and Ifa Lertori, uh, who kind of uh, really get into the nitty-gritty of these, of these statistics. But I believe at last count there were, we were 96,000 beds short of need. And when did uh, antipsychotic drugs become part of the equation? Well, you know, it, it was, Thorazine itself was, was discovered in the 50s. So this is, they've been around for a very long time, but around the time that David Rosenhan and his seven other people went undercover in psychiatric hospitals, that's when the real story of the antipsychotic, like, you know, medicine is changing, you know, changing psychiatry really started to come into full effect. And you had, you had Stelazine and Compazine and all these other antipsychotic drugs that would join the marketplace and really change the way psychiatry was practiced. That was all happening around in the 1970s. So we're going to go back then and spend a little more time with David Rosenhan and what, uh, how you pursued it and what you found out. Here's another clip from him. Uh, as we look at it, you write, in 1969, David Rosenhan walked into the intake room at an unspecified hospital in Pennsylvania and set off a metaphorical time bomb. Let's listen to him, and we'll come back and learn how. The term we use to describe the experience is dehumanized. Nobody talks to you. Nobody has any contact with you. The average contact of patients with staff was about six and a half minutes a day. Nobody comes to visit. The first time I was in a psychiatric hospital, on an admissions ward with 41 men, my wife constituted four of the seven visitors on a weekend. Psychiatric hospitals are storehouses for people in society whom you really don't want, whom you really don't understand, and for whom you've lost a great deal of sympathy. Was that a fact or a, a generalization at that point in time? I think at that point in time, it was probably the norm. I do. I mean, he, you know, it's watching him speak. He's such a beautiful speaker. And it's one of the reasons, and a writer, and it's one of the reasons why I fell in love with this study. He went undercover in a psychiatric hospital at Haverford State uh, Psychiatric Hospital. And he spent nine days there as a patient. And the descriptions that he experienced, are, I mean, it's, they're gorgeous. And I even, in my brief period of being misdiagnosed, related so much to the depersonalization that he described, this feeling of this otherness of being labeled, the idea that doctors kind of see you through a clinical gaze, through, your, through, your, through a prism of your mental illness. These are all things that he, he described, and I believe were probably very common at the time and continue to be common today. So that was his experience, and then he described how he put the rest of the study together with his, his students. So, you know, after that first experience, that nine day at Haverford State Hospital, he said he returned and said students cannot go in because he had a, a, a very painful nine days there. Uh, and, you know, he was a shaken people. His colleagues who I interviewed described a very shaken man. And so he put an end to that teaching exercise. They were not going to follow him in. And the study would have ended there. 
And um, what I only have to focus on and to rely on in terms of what happened next was David's unpublished book, which became, for a brief period of time, kind of a guiding star for me in how to put this narrative together. Um, According to his book, he says that he was lecturing about his experience in the psychiatric hospital, and a pair of uh, a a husband and wife, uh, a psychologist and a psychiatrist, asked if they could go in, too. Now, um, I could not verify that that actually happened, and that ended up being one of the many issues that I started to that started to emerge with the study that started to indicate to me that things were not as they appeared in the, in the way that he portrayed them. In his unpublished book, ultimately, how many people did he say participated in this project? He said all eight participated in the project. The problem was I couldn't verify many of, the, many of his claims and found many inconsistencies as well along the way. So if the book was unpublished, how did this study become so important? Well, because the study itself was published um, in Science, uh, which is one of the most esteemed publications, scientific publications in the world. And I think, you know, in many ways you think eight people, if you, know, if you think of a data set it, as an N in terms of number of, of, you know, kind of subjects, it's not a very scientific or rigorous data set. However, the fact that it was in Science gave it this, this like, um, this feeling of importance, of scientific rigorousness that perhaps it didn't deserve. So that's one of the reasons I think why this study had such a huge effect was actually where it, w- where it was published. It was published in 1973 in it Science. Was in so then what happened? Well, after, after the study was published, I mean, it, there was a huge outcry. And there was kind of two different reactions. On one side, the lay public read this study and kind of it was confirmation of what many suspected. And it was confirmation of what they were seeing in kind of mass media and in the culture. You know, at that time, you had movies like Snake Pit. You had One Floor Over the Cuckoo's Nest. You had a, a, a litany of exposés about the horrors that were happening in psychiatric hospitals. So the fact that David Rosenhan and his pseudo patients came back, A, misdiagnosed, grossly misdiagnosed, and in fact never discovered as pseudo patients, uh, especially, you know, during long stays, one person stayed for 52 days, according to the study, and was never revealed to be, uh, you know, faking her illness. Um, you know, these things kind of confirmed what many people already believed. On the other side, psychiatry itself was going through an identity crisis. And, you know, they had issues with the diagnostic system. There were studies showing that in, on, you know, uh, in the U.S., uh, people were being diagnosed with schizophrenia at higher rates. And in the U.K., the same people were being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So our terms were, were fluid, and we didn't seem to have a common language. And that was very embarrassing. And at, and at the same time, you know, we were moving away from psychoanalysis. And, and psychiatry's role in, the place of, in medicine in general was really coming under fire. So this study really kind of went to, right into that sweet spot at that exact right time. And one doctor um, who, I, who, I, who wrote beautifully about this actually described it as a sword plunged into the heart of psychiatry. A detail, how did those uh, other patients actually get out of the institutions that they were in? Great question. I mean, so in, you know, the average day was 19 days. You know, it, it ranged from 7 to 52 days. And all of them, according to the paper, left against medical advice. So at various points, they, were, they would try to petition to get out and would not be able to get out because they were not seemed well enough, deemed well enough. Now, a major part of the study was that each patient at, would only ad- go to the, you know, commit themselves, would try to commit themselves based on one symptom alone. I hear a voice that says thud, as he described. I hear a voice that says empty. That's it. Once they were admitted, they were to drop any other pretense. And so they didn't hear any voices anymore. They were, they were to act as normal as the situation allowed. And one could simply check your, yourself out of a hospital in that situation if you wanted no, to? No, you could not. In some cases, you'd have to get a court order to be released. The, the, a lot of patient rights, the patient, patient rights movement changed that. And that, that would follow David's study as well. So what's happening in societies, we have this legislation, uh, two piece, important pieces of legislation, which are bringing people out of institutions. We've got this major study, and then you mentioned the societal uh, and, and um, aspects of it. You've a couple times referenced one flew over the cuckoo's nest. I'm hoping everybody that's watching us has seen it. But yeah. I wanted to put a clip on screen because it's really become an iconic movie. Let's watch a little bit. Absolutely. You can talk about the impact that it had on this. As a matter of fact, there are very few men here who are committed. There's Mr. Bromden, Mr. Tabor, some of the chronics, 
And you. Cheswick. Hmm? You're voluntary? Mm-hmm. Scanlon? Billy, for Christ's sakes, you must be committed, right? No, 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 no. Well, Jesus, I mean, you guys do nothing but complain about how you can't stand it in this place here, and then you haven't got the guts just to walk out? I mean, what do you think you are, for Christ's sake, crazy or something? Mm -hmm. Well, you're not. <laughs> you're not. So we uh, still talk about this movie Absolutely. and the characters all these years later. What impact did it really have? Uh, and are you surprised that something like a movie can have such a cultural impact? Well, you know, at the time, you know, when the, when the study was out, this movie actually was not out yet. It was the book that had the tremendous effect. But I think what it did, both the movie and the book, really shaped public opinion about psychiatry, about not only its limitations, but the dangerousness of its power, embodied in the Nurse Ratchet character, who was on the... Who was on there. And, you know, I think that it had um, a huge effect on, on people's kind of um, distrust of psychiatry. And I think that, too, kind of made psychiatry double down in a lot of ways in response to, to that kind of general public distrust of, of its field. So what happened? How did the, the field respond? Specifically to the stu to the study, all or all of this swirling around. Well, them. this is this is really interesting because the study itself had a very very kind of key effect on psychiatry's response, which is embodied in the kind of bible of psychiatry, which is called the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So I actually, during my um, unearthing of all of these correspondences and, and David Rosenhan's history, I found a, kind of a treasure trove of letters between. David Rosenhan and a man named Robert Spitzer, who uh, was the uh, creator of the DSM-3, which is the third edition of the of the famous manual that affects our lives still today. Um, and it, the, Robert Spitzer was um, very much against this study, and he spoke out very widely about his distaste for the study and his um, kind of pushback against it. But in the letters between them, I see this back and forth, and I realize that Robert Spitzer actually saw the study as an opportunity, and I confirm this with his wife. So basically, at that time, in 1973, he was starting to work on what would become the dsm 3 and which would become basically a, um, a medicalization of psychiatry. It would basically put together a manual that would make everything very prescribed and orderly. Um, people described it uh, kind of disparagingly as a Chinese menu approach. It was um, a way of reclaiming psychiatry's role um, within medicine and really make it scientifically rigorous, make sure we're all speaking the same language, we're all using the same diagnoses. So that's one person in Arizona would be diagnosed the same as another person in, in Maine. That was the major kind of push of the DSM. And what I found was that during the writing and creating of the DSM, Robert Spitzer often thought of David Rosenhan and his study. And he would often say things, sing, they say, they things like, could David Rosenhan and the pseudo patients get past this if we had this criteria? So it was amazing to me to kind of see their interaction and also hear the um, incredible effect that, that the study had on, on the kind of Bible of psychiatry. So to sort of put all these pieces together, you're asking yourself the question, really, what is mental illness and how does society uh, understand that? You find out about this, um, this key study that David Rosenhan did that impacted the uh, the profession and really the country's view of it. So when did you start asking yourself questions about its validity? I would say, you know, when I started to dig, dig into those files and I actually got access to David Rosenhan's medical records, that's when questions started to really emerge. Uh, and in those medical records, I found that David Rosenhan did not just exhibit a voice that says, thud, empty, hollow, as he often said he did, as it was a huge part of that paper, he actually uh, exhibited way more severe signs of psychosis than that. In the medical records, I hear repeatedly that he said he put copper pots over his ears to drown out the noises, that he had been dealing with hearing voices for many, many months, that he had a long history of depression, and that he was often suicidal. 
And that, to me, created a far more nuanced and a far, a far more severe portrait of a psychotic illness than I hear a voice that says the empty hollow. And once I got access to that, other things started to not make sense. And maybe things that I had been ignoring previously um, started to fall in line as um, major issues with the study. So you set out to find the other people who participated. Uh, how did that effort go? It was a rabbit hole, um, and unfortunately, I was able to find only one of the original eight. And this is, again, six years of digging. I hired a private investigator. I, you know, interviewed hundreds of people uh, and unfortunately could only find one. It was a gra- He was a graduate, graduate student at Stanford. He was in David Rosenhan's class on psychopathology, and this was in 1970, and he went undercover at Agnew State Hospital. His name is Bill Underwood. And he, um, I, I tracked him down to Aust- the Austin Hills and interviewed him and his wife. And his experience very much mirrored that of David's. He had um, a kind of a terrible time at Agnew State Hospital, which was at the time in the process of closing. And he described very similarly the depersonalization. At one point, he was even mistaken for another patient who had diabetes and almost given insulin. Uh, therapy. At another point, he actually swallowed uh, Thorazine because he had been given a Thorazine tablet that was a rapid melt tablet. Um, and the idea of cheeking it, which is how they were trained, to, what they were trained to do with the pills, just wouldn't have worked with a rapid melt. Um, and so he was drugged and, and, and in a stupor when his wife visited. And it was, it was very traumatic for everyone involved. Um, so I, I found him and, and felt very positive about that. But through him, I found another person. He was not one of the eight. He was uh, a ninth pseudo patient, um, a man who I call now the footnote in many ways, yeah. Who was he? His name was Harry Lando, and he, his name is Harry Lando. He is a professor of psychology at uh, University of Minnesota, and he studies smoking cessation. He, he, he started also as a, uh, as, as a uh, graduate student at Stanford and actually stuck with psychology. Um, he went for 19 days undercover as a patient at the U.S. Public Health Ho- Service Hospital and was misdiagnosed, as David wrote, everyone was, with schizophrenia. Um, however, that's, the, that's where his situation and his experience, the similarities ended. He had described to me um, that he had a positive experience in, during his 19 days. He was an unhappy graduate student at the time. He was in an unhappy marriage. He felt lost and isolated. He felt like he was in a very competitive atmosphere in, at Stanford. And when he, had, when he admitted himself to the hospital, he felt this tremendous relief. He walked on the wards, and he described them as light and bright. The nurses were engaged. No one wore uniforms. There were men and women they, that sang, they sang Peter, Paul, and Mary in the hallways. You know, he, he had a, a wonderful 19 days, and he felt that it was a healing environment. Uh, and this did not match David's thesis at all. Um, this was kind of the opposite of David's thesis in many ways. So, therefore, he was not included in... The final product. Unfortunately, David Rosenhan passed away before I started the study. I could not ask him directly, but Harry Lando believes very ardently that his data did not support the thesis that David Rosenhan was writing, and so he discarded the data. How did he feel about the, and, uh, spending his life in a profession where he was part of such a pivotal study and yet had questions about its validity? Well, you know, it's interesting because I think it, I, when I came to him with my questions and my, and, and kind of Digging this back up, I think he went back and looked at it with a gimlet eye. When he was excluded from the study, he felt disappointed and he felt a little bit angry. He didn't know. He, he learned about it when he actually read the study in science. But I don't think he knew kind of enough to put it in the context of thinking, oh, this, there's something fishy here. But as I started to present other issues that I had found with the study, I think he reframed his experience and thought, okay, maybe this was, maybe I was excluded because he had a bias and he wanted the study to fit his bias. So as a journalist digging through all this stuff, what was the point when the scale got tipped for you, uh, when you went from exploring to questioning? I would say, I would say probably Harry. I mean, I, you know, the medical records for me were, were damning. Um, I also, in, the resp- in kind of a, a kind of lead up to discovering those medical records, I also discovered some discrepancy with data, which to me, uh, in a scientific paper, to have issues with the data was 
at that point, it, it tipped me over to really feeling that there were some like serious problems with the paper. And that was reflected actually through, through Harry because I had two drafts of the study. One draft had nine pseudopatients, no footnote. The other draft had eight pseudopatients, one footnote, leading me to believe... I think very fairly, that the earlier paper he did not remove David, uh, remove Harry Lando, and the later paper he did. And unfortunately, none of the numbers, not one, changed. We still had 2,100 pills given. We still had, you know, um, down to the decimal number of minutes that psychiatrists spent on average outside of their, uh, on the floor, or nurses spent out of the cage. I mean, very highly specific numbers, not one changed. And that, to me, was, was pretty damning that I thought, okay, there is some, this is beyond sloppiness. There's, there's some kind of willful uh, massaging here. So once you had this more or less aha moment that this is not all adding up, what did you do with that, uh, that hunch? Well, you know, at first I thought the book's done because I really thought that I wanted to find these pseudo patients. And the more I dug, I started to doubt maybe if these pseudo patients really existed at all. And I thought, what do I do now? And I really thought that the book was over. Uh, you know, now in retrospect, I realize it's actually a more interesting book, you know, having this kind of search for this, for these answers, you know. And, but at the time, I thought, what am I going to do with this? And I was also very much embedded in, in David Rosenhan's world. I was, I'm very close with his very close friends. I'm close with his son, Jack. And it made me very uncomfortable because in many ways he was a hero. I loved that study. And it was, it was a kind of, it was a lesson that you don't want to kind of meet your heroes. You don't want to learn more about your heroes because they might let you down. I felt very let down. What about his family? You had to have presented the evidence at yes. some point to them that their uh, relative, their close relative's yes. life work may have not been valid. So how did they react? It was really difficult. And, you know, one of the reasons why this took so, six years is that I wanted to be sure. And I wanted to dig up every single lead I possibly could. I um, had a confidant who was David's, who I have a confidant who is David's very close friend, Florence Keller. And she was kind of a, a guru going through this. She knew him. She was one of his best friends. And she went through every major reveal with me and at various points um, came to very similar conclusions that I did. So I felt supported by someone who knew him very well in some of my, the things that I was finding. The hardest person to talk to about this was his son. And I, I, I took him out to lunch. I remember when I first had an inkling that things were awry and I presented some of these issues to him. And his response at the time was, my father was a storyteller, but I don't think he would do anything to mess with his research. So that was his stance then. And then as the book started to come together and publication loomed, I fact-checked the book with him and made it very clear that this was might not make for pleasant reading and that the conclusion I came to um, might not kind of put his father in the best light. And he's a lovely person, he's a Jack Rosenhan. And he, he actually called me two days ago after he read the book in full. And he, he, he says that he actually likes it. He says it was hard to read, but in many ways, the kind of twinkle that was his father, this charismatic man, this kind of amazing thinker, it still comes across, even though there are now questions in terms of some of the validity of the study. And I'm happy to hear that he had that response to it. How long ago did Rosenhan die? Rosanne died in 2012, about a year before I started investigating the study. And w did his pub publisher answer the question of why his book never got published? He, the uh, publisher actually sued him um, because he never delivered. And that was, another in, that was another kind of clue to me that kept kind of haunting me. I said, why, what, why didn't he finish this book? He had eight chapters written. He had the good bulk of it, well over 100 pages written. This would have been a, a smash success. The study was huge. He was a media celebrity. Why not publish the book? And that really was an interesting thing. And so I tracked down um, a lawsuit in 1980. A Doubleday was his publisher. And they actually sued him to recoup the advance that they had given him, which was a pretty sizable advance. Uh, so, you know, so that to me was a big question. I still don't know why he didn't do the book. I have some ideas. I have some, you know, theories, but I still don't know why he didn't finish that book. He didn't share his reasoning with his family. He did not. Not that I know. Yeah. So then let's get to the core of the question. What's the implication if Rosenhan's study was not valid? Well, you know, because Rosenhan's study had such a wide kind of influence on so much of what we contend with today, so much of the mental health crisis that we see today was touched in some ways by this study and a lot of public opinion about 
psychiatry about its institutions were in part shaped by the study. So I think that in questioning it, we have to go back and question, and question some of our assumptions. And I hope that this gives us an opportunity to kind of go back and reassess in a way to move forward because you can't move forward on a rotten foundation. And if this study wasn't up to snuff, if it wasn't legitimate, we really have to rethink some of the conclusions that, that it presented. You told us about the connection between Rosahan study and DSM-3. What does DSM stand for? Oh, way? sorry, Diagnostic, Statisti- uh, Diagnostic <laughs> Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And what version are we on now? Five. So there was a, a relationship between the development of that and Rosenhan's yes. study. Um, it, it, was it one where you questioned the DSM readings? I do. <laughs> I, I mean, I, and I think that most psychiatrists who are, especially research psychiatrists, but most psychiatrists who are more in the cutting edge areas definitely question the DSM. Even the NIMH now uh, want uh, their, uh, their researchers to use a different criteria than the DSM. They... The DSM presents illnesses in hardline senses. We have schizophrenia, we have bipolar disorder, and they're kind of, uh, they're separated, right? And they have different criteria. But what people are finding in the research side, again, these are all big questions, we don't have answers, but what they're finding is that genetically um, there are overlaps and that there are kind of more gray areas between these diagnoses than there are hard lines. So I think that Rosenhan's pushed the field to kind of you know, kind of defend itself and say, we are legitimate, this is our criteria, and we're going to be very strident about the terms that we use. And But unfortunately, in response, it kind of created a black and white system where it's, a lot of it's very gray. Everything that, re- that deals with the brain is very gray. And I think that, um, we, we, I think there is a reckoning with that today now, too. Here's um, another set of statistics uh, that you <clears throat> report in the book that, uh, I, to me, seems like a demonstration of having this uh, roadmap of diagnoses. Uh, since this period of time, childhood bipolar diagnoses, disorder diagnoses, increased 40-fold in yeah. 15 years. There's been a 57-fold increase in children's autism spectrum diagnosis from the 70s to today. Today, 8% of all children in the U.S. are diagnosed with hyperactivity disorder, and 15% of all high schoolers are diagnosed with ADH, attention deficit. Uh, What should we understand from those numbers? I mean, these are such hard questions, right? I mean, these are questions I don't have answers to because hard lines do do kind of protect us against overreach, right? But is this overreach or was it underreach before? I mean, these are questions that we have to grapple with within the field, outside of the field, as a society, and, and they're difficult ones, and I don't have the answers for that. So related to that, we talked earlier about pharmaceuticals. Uh, What impact has been the growth of the pharmaceutical industry had on uh, how we approach all of these questions in society? Well, what's what's been amazing to me and kind of my pursuit of these questions is that I learned how much medicine, psychiatry in particular, but medicine in general, is man-made. You know, we have these, um, you know, guidelines that um, move and change and adapt and they're moved and changed and adapted by many things, and some of them are pharmaceutical industry interests. You know, and some is is changing sta- standards. You know, more understanding about technology and our, our understanding about the body. I mean, there's kind of good and bad with these moving targets, but that was incredibly um, kind of enlightening to me about how 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 kind of man made, how artificial, how um, how gray a lot of medicine is, and I think that the pharmaceutical interest in psychiatry is something that that I think the field is really starting to come to terms with now, right now. You yeah. have been out speaking about this even before the book was published to psychiatry groups and the like. What's been the reaction to you questioning the basic foundational tenets of their profession? I mean, I hold, I think the best psychiatrists embrace this. Because it's constantly moving forward. Robert Spitzer, for example, who created the DSM-3, he created that document to be a living, breathing document because he said, we don't have a lot of knowledge yet. We are talking about the brain. It is an isolated organ. It's impossible to study in real time. We can't, like, really look at it and touch it. You know, it's, it's, it's a... The psychiatry deals is a, with very complex issues, and I think that our hope is that what we are what we're dealing with right now will seem primitive in fifty years. So I think people who are really thinking about these issues and really interrogating them welcome questions. We don't push against that. I think 
what I hope in this book is that, that I raise these questions for a reason so that we can think more critically about some things that we take for granted as being just the truth. Well, circling back to your own experience with this, uh, where will the questioning come of whether or not this has got a biological or organic base as opposed to mental health? In terms of? of people getting diagnosed. Oh, in terms of if we, if we have like a, a test, a blood test or an yeah, objective so measure, right. Is, are, you, um, are people beginning to question, could this be something other than a, a mental health issue? Could it have biological origins uh, that, as your own experience did, the DSM doesn't provide for that? Well, of course, because we don't have those answers yet. I mean, I think that what you're saying is it, this dichotomy that I think is false. Because I think in a lot of ways what we're going to discover is that there's really no difference between organic or inorganic or psychiatric versus neuro- neurological. I think there's going to be so much overlap. And I think eventually down the line, this is my hope, and I'm very optimistic, and I'm not a doctor, but this is my hope, is that those terms kind of become outdated um, and that we discard them the more we learn about the brain, the body, and the interface between the two. Yeah, we're uh, getting pretty close to our hour, but there's one aspect of what's happening in society today that we haven't Reference. You talked about the number of homeless people. Some of that's economic, of course. Uh, some of it mental, mental illness. And we don't really know, do we, as a society, of how many homeless people have mental illness? I mean, I think there are estimates about 100,000 people with, with um, serious mental illness live on the streets. Another thing that you've pointed out that we've been doing is putting people in jail with mental yes. illness. I've got one other piece of video. This is from uh, a... Um, uh, Chicago, uh, where a forward-thinking uh, Cook County official has been trying to uh, introduce uh, this, these questions into how we put people in jail. Let's watch that. An average of 70,000 men and women pass through Cook County Jail each year, many more than once. What percent do you think here really shouldn't be here? I would suggest conservatively that half of the people here in the jail shouldn't be here. The county sheriff, Tom Dart, says the jail has become a dumping ground for the poor and mentally ill. So another big societal question that we have to ask. He's amazing. I think the work that he's doing is incredible. I know he put a psychologist that's a head warden, I mean, of his jail. He's basically coming to terms with the reality that many of us don't want to face. The fact that we're putting people who are very sick in prisons and jails in places that are not healing. They're punitive. You know, they're, they're actually the opposite of the place that they should be. And I, I like that he's at least facing this head on. And he know, he's saying this is the situation and we have to deal with it head on. And we have, to, we have to come to terms with the fact that we are putting sick people in, you know, it, we're imprisoning sick people. Uh, and and I, just, I just really think that it's, it's, it's a testament to, to his kind of, his, his way of seeing the world that he's doing. So is Washington... Uh, it, it, right now, we're, of course, uh, very much in, in, in involved in uh, the impeachment issue here, and a lot of policy issues are, are not being attended to. But has this, are these questions being discussed in Washington, D.C., with federal policymakers, or is it mostly a state and local policymakers that are thinking about homelessness and the connection to mental illness, prison population and the connection to mental illness? I mean, I think you're seeing kind of movement or lack thereof in the state side. I mean, I think, I think across the board... From my perspective, we're, we're losing this. We're losing this issue. If we if we have, uh, you know, one of the more forward thinking jails saying half the people don't belong here, clearly we're we're not we're not doing correct. We're we're failing on a federal and a state level. Um, but I think that there are some some bright spots in in my experience. Uh, my experiences. There are some interface between um, police and. Um, and mental health uh, experts that seem to be there are mental health courts that divert people who are seriously mentally ill before they even get into the prison and jail system. So there are some some kind of um, initiatives that seem to be doing something. But I think in so many ways uh, we are are so behind as a culture. And this is something that I think um, is it's it's a kind of a, a wide swath across the political spectrum. We are not doing we are we're. We're not doing the right thing by the, by very, for very sick people. In your book, you describe our mental health care system, a horror show. Yeah. If we look at other countries, England, uh, Canada, other places, are we different in that regard and the way we approach these questions, or is it Western society all in the same place? I, you know, I think that um, we all grapple with many similar issues. I think we probably, I mean, there are some places that seem to be doing this right. There is actually work um, at, that, that's interesting out of um, uh, L.A. that's going on right now um, where they're actually studying a system in Trieste, Italy, and that's a very community 
uh, focused model. It's not an institution model. And it's interesting. It's it's actually um, kind of tiers of care um, that's provided through the community. Um, and um, they're kind of trying to adapt that. And it's been it's really interesting to see that the small town in Italy seems to be doing it right. I actually visited a place that I thought was doing it correctly in South Dakota. Um, and this was a hospital system there where um, not only do they have a mobile triage unit that goes to the actual um, sickest people in the community, they interface with police officers. They have suicide hotlines for farmers manned by farmers and they have acute care units and longer term care units and they have nurses and attendants who really care about their job and really um, care about the people there. I mean, I, I went and in a similar way that Harry Lando described his experience, the wards were light and bright and airy and it felt healing. And I've been to a lot of psychiatric hospitals in the course of researching this book. I would not use those words to describe pretty much any other ones that I saw in terms of the state level. So you end by saying you believe that psychiatry will one day be deserving of the faith you have in it to adapt. Yeah. What will get our society there? Well, I think in, in kind of as kind of simplistic as this might sound, I think that psychiatry at its best is the art of medicine writ large, right? It's really listening to the patient. It's really relating to the patient. It's taking deep patient histories. It's using all five senses in, in terms of taking in the patient because so we don't really have, we don't have blood tests. We don't have these objective measures. Um, so you need to really focus on the art of medicine. And so I, I hope that as we, as we learn more about the body and the brain, these, the, the art of medicine won't be discarded and that, it, that as we kind of make these advancements, those, those will be married and, um, and care will improve. So that's, that's my hope. I am optimistic about that in the long term. So really the last seven, eight years of your life, either through your own experience or working on this book, has been consumed with this question of what is mental illness yes. and how do we treat it? You're obviously so passionate about this. Are, do you think you're going to be spending more time on this subject? Are there more questions to be asked or is it time to put your skills to something else? Oh, wow. What a great question. You know, I have to say I'm obsessed, and I think maybe because it comes from a personal place, but I don't believe I'm done talking about these issues, no. Because it's, there's still so much. I mean, the, the minute you peel that onion, it's just more layers and more layers and more layers. So I think I'm going to be talking about this for a long time. Well, thank you for talking about it with us for the past hour. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email at podcast at c-span.org with your questions, comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.